Good evening, good evening, good evening, fellow citizens of the household of God. This is Wednesday night Bible study, uh, Ezekiel chapter 18. We will get started in just one minute, so please take the next few seconds as we pray to get pen, paper, as long as well as you pray. You just don't not pray, but I need you to pray. Uh, <clears throat> get pen, paper, and get ready to take some notes in order to further uh, understand and develop the word of the Lord in you. <coughs> Excuse me. So let us go ahead and pray. Father God, we thank you for tonight. We give you glory, honor, and praise. God, we ask you to forgive us of all sins, sins of the mind, the body, and the spirit. Lord, take full control of us. Forgive us of our shortcomings. Make us ready, meet for the master use in Jesus name. God speak to our hearts and our minds. Allow us to hear your word. Allow us to hear you speaking to us to be obedient and to follow and to develop in your word in Jesus name. Lord anoint my mouth that I may speak only what you've said and then let the hearer hear you and you alone. In Jesus name we pray. We agree and say amen. God bless you all. Thank you for joining tonight. We're going over Ezekiel chapter 18. Now, <clears throat> I want to put a title to this chapter because God gave one. The title for this chapter is, You're Prosecuting Your Own Case. If you understand the dynamics of a court system, there is a judge who will render judgment according to evidence presented to him in the case. There is a defense attorney, which would be your defense attorney. Then there's also a prosecutor. That's a prosecuting attorney. DA, assistant DA, that sits on the opposite side of the court who presents evidence against you to convict you and say that you're guilty. So then when God says that you are prosecuting your own case, you are the prosecutor. Listen, there is no defense. The only defense is Jesus. So if you are, if you are not covered in the blood of the lamb, if you are not walking uprightly before God and, and give, the only thing you can do for yourself standing in the judgment seat before God, standing in the judgment place before God, is prosecute yourself. That's all you can do. You're just going to present evidence after evidence after evidence of wrongdoing, of rebellion, of not listening, walking in disobedience. That's the prosecution that you are doing to yourself each day that you go without allowing Christ into your heart allowing Christ to cover your sin, allowing Christ to shed his blood over your life, washing you clean. All you do is live a life of prosecution. You prosecute yourself. Let me show it to you. Let's look at verses one through three. Ezekiel chapter 18, verses one through three. The word of the Lord came unto me again saying, what mean ye that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on the edge. Verse 3, very important. As I live, said the Lord God, ye shall not have occasion anymore to use this proverb in Israel. Why are you using this proverb, God asked? Why are you blame shifting? As if we can, anybody, as if anybody can stand before God and say, I lived a spotless life, God. So why am I having to pay the cost for what my daddy did, what my grandfather did? Now, some of you Bible thumpers, will come along and say, yeah, but Bishop, it says that God will visit the iniquities unto the third and fourth generation. I need you to understand what God is telling you. When he says he'll visit that, that means that 
from the first generation, let's just use me. My daughter, my grandchildren, and my grand great-grandchildren would all follow my lead doing the same thing, recommitting it over and over and over. That's how that's able to stay there. Because he breaks down later on in this scripture, in this chapter, the fact that, well, let me read it to you. Verse four, behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the father, so also the soul of the son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. But if a man be just and do that which is lawful and right, and hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, neither hath defiled his neighbor's wife, neither hath come near to the menstruous woman, and hath not oppressed any, and hath restored to the dead or his pledge, hath spoiled none by violence, hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment. He that hath not given forth upon usury, neither hath taken any increase, that hath withdrawn his hand from iniquity, hath executed true judgment between man and man, hath walked in my statutes, and hath kept my judgment to deal truly. He is just. He shall surely live, saith the Lord God. Now, let me open up your understanding because to some folk that was just a bunch of words put on paper and they didn't quite understand it. Well, let me give it to you. Let me bring it to uh, the century we're in and the time that we're in because I'm a firm believer of the fact that when you read the word of God, it speaks to your life in the time that you live in. God says this, Everybody belongs to me. Everybody. I don't care who you are. Everybody belongs to me. Mama, daddy, brother, sister, cousin, uncle, everybody. And so God is such a good God. He will not impugn penalty on me for something my daddy did, except that I do the same thing my daddy did. Then it's not my father's sin it becomes my own. So we need to stop using the proverb of saying that God has visited the father's sin upon the child. No, no. What has happened is the child has taken upon himself the instruction of the father and followed it to a T and enjoyed the sin that the father enjoyed. We are so much in this world right now we do so much blame shifting. It's, it's, it's even in the church. If God don't do something for somebody, they'll shift the blame. I came up to the preacher and asked him to pray for me and God didn't. Somebody came and asked and, and God said he would do such and such. And, and listen, listen, here it is. Here it is. Let me give it to you. Let me give it to you. Let me give it to you. If God says he's going to do something and the man of God declares it in your life, must understand that there are certain things that you must line up with before those things come to pass. What you saying, Bishop? So y'all think that it's just okay to treat God like trash and him give you treasure? I, I'm sorry. I, I'll repeat that. Y'all think it's okay to treat God like trash Yet he give you treasure. What is that? What is that? If the bishop says, God is going to heal you, God is going, but I need you to do such and such. There are conditions. Uh, uh. So if he is hearing from God and God has required something of you in order to fulfill and manifest said word in your life. You must follow instructions. So stop going to church. Stop going to these preachers, teachers, and everybody expecting God to make a miracle happen in your life and you give God trash. 
but expect him to give you treasure. You don't live no kind of life. You don't obligate yourself. You don't commit nothing to God, but you want God to intervene in your life when trouble is all around. When nothing is at peace, when everything is in turmoil, you want God to fix it all, but you don't want to give God anything. You don't want to change your lifestyle. You don't want to do anything. Now, here, the word of the Lord, what God is saying is this. Let me, let me, I want to bring it all in to focus. God is simply saying, I know everybody and I know all that you do, even in secret. There is nothing hid from me whereby you can no longer use the proverb that somebody else calls you to sin. No, 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 no. You did it. You're responsible for your individual decision, your individual choices. Well, it's been a family tradition. Break tradition. You will not stand at the gates of heaven to be judged as a family. I'm sorry. You will stand alone. So in order for you to make it through the gates, you've got to make the decision, for God I live and for God I'll die. You've got to make the decision that I turn my back on things that will only last a season. We put so much stock in, in foolish things that only last a season. Before you know it is over. God forbid, before, it's, before you know it, the person you didn't enjoy that time with is dead. Gone on. Old folks used to sing a song, I believe I'll run on and see what the end going to be. You ain't got no choice. You ain't got no choice of the matter. You're going to live the amount of time that God has appointed to you. The question is, can you determine what the end going to be? Absolutely. You can either prosecute yourself or allow Jesus to come in and be your defense attorney. As soon as God sees the sin, Jesus stands up, but I covered that. It's covered. God said, no more need to be sick. Gavel comes down. <laughs> Not guilty. Huh? Not guilty. Ooh, it's good to have friends in high places. What you say? Instead, the children of Israel felt like the amount of trouble that they were going through was attributed to the delinquency of the parents before them. Here's the problem. Y'all engaged in said same behavior that your parents did. So don't blame your parents. Look at yourself. When you become an adult, the age of understanding, you can no longer blame me. You can no longer say, well, daddy, you taught me to, whoa, whoa. You have your own mind. You make your own decision. You decide whether or not you're going to do what's right. You decide whether or not you're going to choose someone that God has blatantly told you no. Church folk don't want to hear that kind of talk, Bishop. I'm sorry. The Bible says, be not unequally yoked with an unbeliever. Why, why y'all chasing these unbelievers? Why y'all doing that? Why y'all trying to talk to people who don't want what you want? And then you look at God and question why, well, God, why am I going through this? It must be attributed from someone else. Someone else must be depositing their wrong upon my life and I'm paying a debt for my mama, for my daddy, for my uncle, for my, no. God said, no, you ain't gonna use that proverb no more. Nope, 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 nope. I'm aware of each individual and they all belong to me. And guess what? The soul that sent it, is responsible for its own sin, not another. You prosecute your own case. My daddy cannot prosecute my case, neither can he stand and be a defense attorney for me. I must stand alone. God will hold me responsible for my yeas and my nays. My disrespect, my, dis my discord, my disconnect, my disobedience, all of that belongs to me. Verse five through nine. But if you be just, even in an unjust home. So let me, let me, let me tell you why God spoke that to me. There are some folk who live in a home that don't have God being taught 
that don't have an influence of God, relationship. I'm not talking about church. Uh, to all you church folk out there who, who will stand up in a minute, I go to church every Sunday. I go to church every Saturday. I go to church every time the doors is open. You can go ahead and take your uh, your time card. You go ahead and take that time card somewhere else. That don't mean nothing to God. Your clock card, I clock the church every Sunday. That don't mean nothing. God is looking at relationship. There was a reason why Jesus' whole ministry was done outside of those four walls. He very seldom went into the four walls. But we put so much stock in these four walls. We do that time card clocking in all the time. Boy, we don't, we, you can't beat nobody. We even got seats in the church that got people's name on them. And if you sit in the wrong seat, oh my God, you done committed the biggest sin. You know better than that. God is not impressed, people. God says, I'm looking at relationship. I'm looking at your life's direction according to my plans for it. I know my thoughts, I think, toward you, thoughts of peace and not of war. So God says, I know the plans when I called you into existence. I know the plans I had for you, and you're not following the plan. You're not following the blueprint. I don't know what you're doing. Every time I mention something to you, you reject it. I tell you I want you to go such and such place. You reject it for familiarity of family or for dedication to loved ones or familiarity to my, my grandfather went to this church for 30 years. This is the church I belong to. Do you know how many times I hear that in the city of Temple? I hear it so many times. And I know it to be true all over the world. People are loyal to buildings, to organizations, not God. It's a relationship thing. It's not a loyal, we don't get loyalty points. We don't get, re, we don't get loyalty reward points for this. No, it's relationship. Bishop, what you're saying, we don't have to be loyal to God. I didn't say that. I said to buildings, to organizations. But when you're loyal to God, you will stand up when they say sit down and say for God, I, I'm standing for uh, the bloodstained banner. I, we don't hear those words spoken very often anymore because we have moved away from the, the language of believers, the language of the sanctified saints, the language. Now, I'm not one to push old style on nobody. That's not my point. But then when I sit down to talk to you, I ought to hear Jesus. When I come to say hello, I ought to feel Jesus. I ought to feel that, that radiating off of you. I, he said, let your light so shine that men might see your good works and glorify your father, which is there. Why would we glorify God, which is in him? Because we know God sent you to do the work that you're doing because I knew you when you was younger and you wasn't quite so nice. But now you seem to be so pleasant and so welcoming. It, it, it's a point of us getting away from our old selves, walking in the newness of God. Not allowing our past to provide excuses for current failures. Stop that. Stop that. Rebuke the enemy. There's a reason for scriptures. People of God, please understand the word of God. When he says resist the devil and he will flee, he means that. Apply it. You don't put up no kind of resistance. The idea is present it. You bounce it around in your head without resistance and you go right into it. God said, resist the devil and he'll flee you. Resist. Put up a fight. Say, God, when I go to do good, evil is always present. I don't want to do evil. God, help me do good. Come on, fight. You are the only one who can prosecute you. You can't say the devil made you do it. Notice I said when the idea is presented, all he going to do is present the idea. He has to 
Oh, bless God. He has to operate by the same rules, regulations, and laws that God set from the beginning. It must be choice. Mm. Some of y'all just caught that and go get free. It must be choice, even with the enemy. You can't say the devil made you do so. He presents the offer. You must accept. If you don't accept, then you're fighting. There you go. Fight the enemy. But you don't know nothing about that. So you feel like every idea that's presented to you, you got to accept wrong. Wrong, 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 wrong. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. It's his power and his might that gets you where you need to be in your life. So resist the devil and he'll flee. Resist the sinful nature of your old self. Put off that old man. Take on the new. Christ is not asking you to live a godly life with the old man you were accustomed to. See, I, God gave something the other day and he explained something. The, the, the battles that we fight that we lose most frequently, generally, are because the warrior we're fighting is us. Catch it. Who knows when I'm going to throw an overhand right? I do. Who knows when I'm going to throw an uppercut? I do. So when I'm fighting me, I know what I'm going to do. So if you're not careful, you'll lose the battle against yourself every time. Because you know how to fight you. And that's the old you. Any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I'm trying to help you because the title of 18 is you, you're prosecuting your own case. You are prosecuting your own case. So as you make your decisions, as you live your life and you continue to live your life in a way that is unpleasing to God, you have no one to put the blame on. God says you can't use that proverb anymore. What pro Ooh, excuse me, what proverb? Proverb concerning the land of Israel saying the fathers have eaten sour grapes. The fathers have sinned. And the children's teeth have been set on edge. The children have to pay the cost for what the father ate. What? No. No, we don't. No, we don't. No, we don't. Nope, 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 nope. Nope, 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 nope. My father was a railroad, railroad man. I have never worked for the railroad. Psycho broken. Hello. If y'all didn't catch that. You don't have to repeat the sins of the father. You don't have to repeat the sins of the mother. You don't have to repeat the sins of what are being committed in the house that you live in. There are so many people, young adults living in houses where the parents have pulled away from the church because they did not like the way mama and daddy drugged them to church. They didn't like that. So then they decided and set forth the precedence to say, I'm not going to do this to my child. Here's the problem. When you don't give the, bless God, when you don't give the child the correct information to make an intelligent decision, they will fall to the falsehood of this world because the world is constantly giving and feeding our kids information right now. Every device they got will feed them false information. Questioning God's existence, questioning God's ability to provide for his people, questioning God's ability to have provided for us salvation. They question everything. Every device, we've got to be careful, people. Y'all don't understand the reason why we thought we had beat COVID. Yeah. We thought it was over. Everybody declare, take your mask off. Delta come back and say, put them back on because I'm here. And guess what? I'm moving faster and doing more damage because you didn't get it the first time. See, those of us who knew to pray began to pray, but then we stopped. We stopped going on our knees when we felt like it was safe to go back outside. God said, stop jumping rope with me. Stop playing. Get serious. 
You're going to sit there and use the problem. Well, why is the COVID here? What have we done? Da, da, da. Nobody's questioning that. What have we done? Question yourself. What have you done? And what have you not done? You know, they, they get mad at preachers when they say, what have you done? And don't be accusatory, preacher. Okay, so what have you not done? Have you not prayed? Have you not fasted? Have you not gone before God? Have you not committed yourself unto a righteous walk with God? Have you changed at all? Have you done anything? The Bible says, turn from your wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, forgive your sin and heal your land. The land ain't being healed. So we must not be turning. Ain't nobody ready to change. That's why the children of Israel decided that they wanted to shift blame with putting it on the father, stating that we live a spotless life. This is the problems of our father, not us. God comes and tells them, no, it's not. Let's look at verse 10 through 13. But if a just man has a son who goes to the unjust, who goes off, let, let, let's read that 10 through 13. If he beget a son that is a robber, a shedder of blood, and that, huh, that doeth the like to any one of these things, previous things named that you do, mm, and that doeth any of those duties, but even hath eaten upon the mountains and had defiled his neighbor's wife, hath oppressed the poor and needy, has spoiled by violence. He goes on and gives a listing. Listen, a listing of things that this son born to this righteous man has done. He goes on to say that that son that sinneth shall surely die. I want to give you an explanation of what it's talking about when it says death and life. Okay, let's look at Romans 8. Verses 5 and 6. Romans 8. Verses 5 and 6. This is a, a wonderful spot to give an explanation in scripture now. Here's the beautiful part about God. God is not going to leave you ignorant. God is not going to leave you without wisdom. God is going to give it to you if you ask him. Seek and you'll find. In other words, get in the book and look for it. Here, here we go. Romans 8 verses 5 and 6 says this. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Listen. Verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death. That's explaining death. But to be spiritually minded is life. And peace. That's life. He explains to be carnally minded. To be conscious of the flesh and the flesh only. To seek after the world. To befriend the world as a child of God is a problem. There is no happy medium. There is no compromise in God. You can't sit there because the world said it was okay and your, your preacher said, okay, we're going to let this come in the church. What? Who's going to stand? God, if I'm wrong in my stand, you correct me, God. But if I'm right, give me the courage to walk, to seek after you. Now, some folk are seeking a setup. What's the setup? I want to see this, this, and this in the church. I want to have this. I want to see this. And this. So you're seeking a setup. You're not seeking God. See, those who come to fellow citizens of the household of God on Saturday, I will warn everybody, church begins at 1130. Promptly, I will begin to preach at 1130. If you ain't coming for the preach word, don't come here. Don't come here because that's what you're getting. You're getting the word from the Lord, wisdom, strength, 
power. You're getting all that in the form of the preach word. I don't got no entertainment for you. I'm sorry. I don't got that for you. Can't do it. Because you can't make it in on that. Time is winding up. You can't make it in on, on a good sound. You can't make it in on a good shout. You can't make it. If you don't have a relationship, you ain't going nowhere. Well, where you're going, you don't want to be, but you know. But but again, God even states you prosecuting your own self. Now, he gave us the the explanation of death and life. Death is to be carnally minded. Life is to be spiritually minded. Now, here's another thing. Romans 7, 21, back up a chapter. Chapter 7, verse 21. And it says, and I, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Listen. Nothing going to catch you by surprise. You should suspect that when you set in your heart to do what's right, God, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to commit. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. God, I, I'm, 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 I'm going to read every day. I'm going to pray every day. If you don't think the enemy is sitting there presenting the idea to you, through you, I told you, most of the battles you lose it's because the warrior is familiar with your fighting style. That's you. The enemy knows you. So the enemy is going to present the idea. Oh, you sleepy. Oh, yes, I am. <clears throat> you didn't pray. Oh, I'm hungry. Oh, yes, I am. <clears throat> you didn't read your word. You broke your commitment to God. Because you don't put up any resistance. You don't fight. It's not worth the fight to you. You feel like all I need to do in this life is just live it. Okay? There's a reward. The reward for just living this life is to be carnally minded, and that means death, which is separation from God. Life, connectivity, relationship with God, and then God says, I'm going to do you one better. I'm going to give you peace along with that life. Yeah, and God's peace, not as man giveth, but as God gives it. It surpasses all that man understands. Man can't understand the peace of God. Why they shooting off guns and everything over everybody's heads, bullets. You can hear the bullet fly by your head, but you ain't scared. You sitting in the place of, ooh, Jesus. Ha, ha. Father, keep, cover. God, help, rescue. That's what you doing as a believer. Mm. Let's look at verse 14 through 17. Again, we see separation of lives. Your life convicts or prosecutes you to a reward. You can grow up in a wrong environment and still choose to live right. I'll repeat that. You can grow up in a non productive environment, in a non nourishing environment. So everybody can stop using the excuse, you don't understand what happened to me when I was a kid. You don't understand what I went through. Whoa, you just grew up in a non-nourishing environment. God says when you become of age of understanding to choose, you then choose what road you travel, what prosecution is presented as a case before you when you stand before God. You choose your prosecution. You choose. Let's, let's see, verse 14 through 17. 14 through 17. Now, lo, if he beget a son that seeth all his father's sins, which he had done, and considereth and doeth not such like, that hath not eaten upon the mountain, neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, hath not defiled his neighbor white, neither hath oppressed any, hath not. Do you see what's going on? Do you see what's going on? What's going on here is the fact that God took and says, okay, so if this father sinned, but this son doesn't, I do not take the sins of this father and put it on this son. They both are separated. The same goes throughout life. So people talk about generational curses. You can talk about it all you want to. The enemy cannot overstep 
the boundaries of confinement that God put him in. Hear me clearly. The enemy cannot overstep the boundaries of confinement that God put him in. When I tell you that it's truth, how do I know? I can take you to scripture. Go to Job and you'll read where Job was minding his own business, living his life, giving God the glory. And Satan went into the heaven, presenting himself among the sons of God. God pointed him out. What you doing? All right. I ain't doing nothing. Just going up and down in the earth. God said, have you considered my son? Listen to the conversation. Go in there and break down that conversation. In other words, you're looking for a fight. I'll give you one. Okay. Have you considered this person? Well, I would, but you have a hedge of protection around him. Well, you can do this to him. He did that. Job didn't turn. He came back for a second round because he got knocked out in the first. Y'all catch it. He came back for a second round. God said, well, you can do this, but you can't do this. He did that. Job still didn't turn. In both situations, Satan got knocked out, but he had to operate within the confines that God gave him. He had to ask permission to go beyond certain boundaries. And God knew, huh, God knew the material makeup of Job. God knew Job's heart. God knew what he was after. Job was a just and upright man who eschewed evil. Get away from me. You, you ain't about nothing. You, uh, you're not going to catch me with that. Cash me outside. How about that? No, not today. I'm good. Go ahead on outside. I'll be in my house talking to my God. You go ahead on. You let me know how that turned out. You can have a fight with you, yourself, and, and yourself. God bless you. We see in 14, he goes on and he tells the story of how if that same sinful man had a son who did not participate in the sins of his father, he would not be penalized for the sins of his father. He would be graded according to the life choices he made. Isn't it beautiful that the God we serve will only hold us responsible for the life choices we make? Ain't that beautiful? Ain't it wonderful? Please, I apologize if there is some technical difficulty. Please understand this video will go up again on YouTube under Bishop John Wayne Jones. So if you can't see it or whatever the problems that are going on right now, God bless you. I'm sorry, but it'll be posted again on uh, YouTube. On uh, Yeah, YouTube. God bless you. Uh, let's keep going so we can get through with chapter uh, 18. I know I'm excited. I, I get that way with the word. Uh, uh, let's look at verses 29 through 32. First, I want you to see a statement that is made. Verse 23, God makes a statement. He says this, have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, said the Lord God, and not that he should return Key word is return from his ways and live. God don't take pleasure in nobody's self-conviction, self-persecution. Second Peter 3, 9. Second Peter 3, 9. Chapter 3, verse 9. Says this, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is very patiently waiting for us. He doesn't take pleasure in losing any of us. So if you think because you lived your life, the best life, and made all these choices, and you stand before God. See, God even addressed the fair and the unfair thing in the next chapter. Yeah. People start calling God unfair. That, that's unfair. That's not right. Uh, whatever. 
He addresses that in the next chapter. But if you think you're going to stand before God, make all these choices, and God not hold you responsible for your choices, where that at? What you mean, Bishop? Can you go to any job, not do what they say, and still get a paycheck? Oh, they'll pay you for the time, but then they you getting ready to resign. Somebody say, no, you don't, you get fired. You resigned yourself because you decided you didn't want to conform to what they wanted. Hello? It's the same principle. You resign yourself to hell if you don't follow the strategies of God that lead you into victory. You did that to yourself. You can't blame nobody. And then God even said that his, his commands are not grievous. They're not hard. They're not hard. Because we try to look at it and put it into the format that man understands. So then man says what this looks like. Uh, when God says this, 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 man says what this looks like. So if you don't come up to man's standard, man prosecutes you on the spot, calls you a non-Christian, and tries to disown you from the body of Christ. Man does that now. The problem with that is God goes deeper. God goes broader than your understanding could ever be. And sometimes the understanding of some things in scripture was applicable to a time. The word hasn't changed, but the application has because the times have. We'll get into that at a different time, but some of y'all already caught that. 29. Yet said the house of Israel, the way of the Lord is not equal. Here we go. I thought it was in 19. It's right here. <laughs> it's not equal. O house of Israel, are not my ways equal? Are not your ways unequal? Verse 30. Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, say the Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves from your transgression. So iniquity shall not be your ruin. I hear the overtones here of God begging. I'm sorry. Just turn from your transgressions so that your iniquities don't ruin you. Just stop. Can you just stop? Just turn. Just If my people which are called by my name, we keep going back to second cross. I'm telling you, God is, 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 is yelling this at us right now. Crying out, speaking loudly, speaking with an author, with the voice of authority. 31. Cast away from you all your transgressions whereby ye have transgressed. And make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? Verse 32, for I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. Uh, I think that's pretty plain and pretty simple um, to me. Um, I, I can, uh, we read it. Uh, God is simply saying, uh, take upon yourself the new heart and the new spirit. Uh, some of y'all's spirit is so wrong, it ain't funny. You come into the house of God with the same spirit you work with in the world. Somebody say, what did you just say, Bishop? Ah, you come into the house of God with the same spirit you work with in the world. Your lips are poked out. You look like you're mad all the time. And you the door person at the house of God. Wrong answer. Wrong answer. If hospitality ain't your thing, sit down. Move. Everybody can't, everybody can't preach. Everybody can't be in the pool. Everybody, every, no. That's not, yeah, Bishop, but my calling... You you felt a pull on your life to get. Mm. Listen, everybody is called. Called into a relationship with God. Everybody. Everybody is called into ministry. Through God. The life that you live is to minister to the lost. You must always be ready to give a word of encouragement, a word to say why. 
you believe in God. Why? Well, well, Bishop, I don't know how to talk like you talk. It ain't about me because the people you're going to meet ain't going to be the people I talk to. Please understand that. The people that God presents to you for you to present what how you talk to are people who relate to you. You don't have to talk like me. Talk like you. We all are called into the ministry. But everybody ain't qualified. Everybody ain't anointed. Some people got gifts and are not anointed. I don't call no names. I'm not talking about nobody. I ain't come in contact with nobody in so long. It ain't funny. Ain't nobody in my head. I'm just telling y'all what God says. And it's truth. So you can't escape the calling. We all are called. The Bible even declares many are called, but few are chosen. What does that mean? Many are called, but few will turn from their previous life and take on the life of the calling of Christ. For I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. That's what that means. When it says many are called, but few are chosen, it's talking about the fact nah, that I choose my calling. I choose to walk uprightly before God, to live a righteous life, to live a life that shines Christ in it. Where everywhere I go, I have a badge that says Christ. It, that don't mean that the conversation you have with me, how you doing, all blessed and highly, that ain't what they're talking about. That is not what they're talking about. That is not what that's talking about. When he says people to see Christ in you, he's talking about your attitude, who you are, the new person. They should see a change. They should see a new you. You should not come off the cuff every time somebody say, hey, what's up? Hey, don't talk to me like that, young man. Put some respect on. Uh, calm down. Calm down. What's up? How are you, sir? Even when young people say to me, hey, whoa, hold on, sir. I'll correct you, but I'll correct you by calling you, sir. Hold on, sir. I need you to address me in a different manner. And I'm going to address you in that manner. Do you hear how I'm talking to you? Yes, sir. All right. Let's move forward. They should see a change instead of, I know you didn't. You did. did uh, whoa, 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 whoa. The old me is passed away. Behold, all things become new. How do I address this issue? Well, I don't know until it comes. It's new. Hello. If she would have said it to me, I would have. Mm, 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 believe her. Christian, are you supposed to have a pre-recorded response? I thought it's supposed to be new every time. That's what the scriptures say. Any man being Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, which means each day is brand new to me. How, how, how can you say that, Bishop Parker? You say, because God says his mercies faileth not. His compassions are new every morning. Every morning. So then a new day is faced each and every day we get. New equipment every single day. We don't have to use the equipment from yesterday. That's the problem with some of y'all. Y'all using outdated equipment to try to handle today's issues. And it ain't getting you nowhere. And you're blaming the equipment. But look, it's not the equipment's fault. The equipment did its job for the day that it was handed out in. New equipment was handed out today. Did you get it? Did you go to God? Did you get your mercy, your compassion? Did you get it? Did you get it? If you didn't, that's not, that's not God's fault. And don't get mad at the compassion from yesterday when they can't handle that big old thing today. Don't do that. Don't do that. The compassion from yesterday did its job yesterday. The mercy from yesterday did its job yesterday. You need to go to God and get the new one for today. Because you're supposed to be a new creature. So you're not supposed to have a pre-recorded response. You're not supposed to have a predetermined uh, uh, attitude. You're not supposed to. Well, I know if they call me on the phone. No, you can't do that. It all must be new. God bless you. I pray that you have received the word on tonight.
We will be going over chapter 19 next week. God bless you. We love you. We appreciate you. Come on, let's pray. Father, we thank you for all ears that have heard your word on tonight, all hearts that were open to receive. Now, God, let your anointing go and establish itself in the heart, mind, body, and ears of each and every believer. Let them walk uprightly before you and begin to walk in a way that is pleasing unto your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray until we meet again this Saturday. God, we thank you. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. And we all say amen. God bless you. Thank you. And good night.